Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, webinar organized by the World Bank Group. Um, my name is Ben Backwell. I am the CEO of uh, GWEC, which uh, represents um, uh, companies and associations in the wind sector around the world. We've been working um, with the World Bank on offshore wind uh, now uh, for over um, uh, a year, um, a year or two, um, on a very exciting program um, to take offshore wind global to new markets um, beyond the uh, traditional uh, European mature markets and into completely new markets. Um, it's really exciting um, for um, one main reason, which is the world is expecting great things uh, from um, non-European markets for offshore wind. Um, there's incredible institutional support for offshore wind at the moment uh, from everyone uh, from the G7 to the IEA to you know, G20 to the European Union. Um, and it really feels like the time has come for offshore wind. Um, but it's still an industry that's concentrated mainly in Europe, um, but also with a strong participation from China and a, and a few other places, notably the US, uh, getting going. Um, now, in order to reach the ambitions that the world has for offshore wind, um, you know, we've seen figures now talked about of something like 1.2 uh, terawatts of power from offshore wind or even 1.4 uh, terawatts um, of power being talked about. Um, now, Europe, the traditional market accounts for something like 450 gigawatts of that target and that's the expectation. But what about everything else? And I think that's why this project from the World Bank is, is really, really um, exciting. Um, because you know, this is where the growth um, is going to come from. Um, so I'm not going to speak anymore. I'm going to introduce today's speakers who are going to uh, dig into the work that's been done and um, the work that continues and the prospects really for, for these new emerging markets in offshore wind. Um, I'll just quickly introduce our speakers and then um, all of them are going to just say a few words about themselves. Um, so we have with us today um, Sean Whitaker, who's the principal industry specialist for the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, part of the World um, Bank Group. We have Clara Ivanescu, who's a geographer for the World Bank. Mark Leibon, who's a senior energy specialist for um, SMAP um, at the World Bank. Um, and then we have two more panelists uh, for our Q&A, Alistair Dutton, who's lead consultant um, at the World Bank and also leads uh, GWEX um, Offshore Task Force and Rachel Fox, who is a GIS consultant who's been uh, involved in some of the uh, really interesting elements of this work, um, also from the World Bank. So I'm gonna ask everyone to say a few words about themselves before we speak. Because Sean, um, you're, you're up first, please. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Ben, and uh, thanks to everybody for, for joining us today. So I'm Sean Whitaker, and I'm with the International Finance Corporation and co-lead of the uh, program with, um, of the Offshore Wind Development Program with uh, Mark Laborn. Mark? Thanks, Sean. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Mark Leibon. I'm part of the SMAP World Bank team. And uh, yeah, I'm co-lead as well with, with Sean. And I'll hand on to Clara. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone. My name is Clara Ivonescu. I'm a geographer in the Geospatial Operational Support Team of the World Bank. And I've been supporting the offshore initiative uh, in the energy unit. Super. All right. Well, um, do you want us Alistair. to introduce yourself quickly? Please, uh, Alistair. Yes, Alistair Dutton, Ben's already said what I do, but uh, in addition, I was lead author to the Going Global report from uh, World Bank Development Program published last October. Hello, and I'm Rachel Fox, and I sit in SMAP with Mark, and Claire and I have been working on the JS effort for the maps that you're about to see. Great. Okay, thank you, everyone. So we're going to kick off our presentations today uh, with Sean. Um, he's going to talk about why offshore wind for emerging markets. Sean. All right. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Ben said, we're going to uh, we're going to do this uh, presentation in three parts. We've got an hour in total. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start off by talking about uh, just providing a general context for, for offshore wind and why it's growing and what is. What are some of the motivating factors uh, for offshore wind in emerging markets? Uh, 
And then I'll pass it over to, to Clara, who's going to talk about some of the, the work that, that we've been doing on uh, technical potential mapping for a number of emerging markets uh, around the world. And then Mark is going to uh, close it out with uh, a discussion of how we're acting on this potential and the work that we're doing uh, within the World Bank Group to uh, work with emerging markets to, to act on the potential. And then uh, we'll open up for a Q&A. And I think uh, there's a, a Q&A function on Zoom that you can use. So uh, please type in your questions uh, as, uh, as they come up. And then um, at the end, uh, Ben is going to moderate a, a general session with all of us. So let's, uh, let's get started. So there's been obviously a lot of uh, a lot of discussion of offshore wind in the uh, you know, offshore wind is not a new thing. It's been around. The uh, first offshore wind was installed in 1991. Uh, but over the past four to five years, there's been a real buzz about it. Um, and uh, there's so it's interesting to kind of, kind of step back and say, well, you know, where is that interest uh, coming from? You know, what are some of the drivers and why ultimately uh, what's the foundation for the program that, uh, that we launched? So the picture that you see here is a support this is a this is a preparing for installation of an offshore wind farm with the towers transition pieces uh, and jacket vessel so as i said uh, offshore wind has grown very quickly over the past uh, over the past four to five years um, we've seen installations last year over um, over six gigawatts um, and that growth has primarily been in europe uh, China is actually the single largest country uh, for installations, but uh, the most of the installations have happened in Europe, and that's kind of the, been the birthplace of, um, of offshore wind. So if you look at that, you say, well, you know, what is it? A, what, what has changed if, if offshore wind has been around for a while? What has changed over the last few years that's really made it such an appealing uh, technology to pursue both in developed markets and increasingly in emerging markets? So let's take a look at some of the the reasons why that's the case. I think really the number one uh, driver behind the growth of offshore wind in uh, recent years has been uh, the falling prices. So the chart that you see here shows the levelized uh, tariff for um, a series of uh, projects that have been announced recently. Um, offshore wind for many years was uh, you know, over 10 or 15 cents a kilowatt hour. It wasn't really uh, considered to be commercial. That really changed about four or five years ago through a series of competitive tenders in uh, in, in Europe uh, that saw the price start to fall under 10 cents per kilowatt hour, then under eight and six cents a kilowatt hour, and uh, this culminated last year in, uh, in CFD round three in the UK, uh, where we actually had a, you know, large scale offshore wind uh, coming in at under five cents per kilowatt hour, and going forward, it's considered that. Uh, you know, the, the offshore wind is starting to compete in merchant markets, and in many places uh, in Europe, it will consider it will be competitive with conventional sources of uh, generation in the next few years. So, reason number one uh, that offshore wind is uh, is growing quickly is certainly the uh, lowering prices. I think really the second reason that we've seen such a boom in offshore is that it is uh, clean power with energy security. Um, so this chart shows uh, current uh, coal consumption and three quarters of coal consumption currently is in Asia. Um, and this is a real concern, particularly for attaining uh, climate targets. Um, and these countries are looking for a way to be able to produce large scale power um, without having to import uh, fossil fuels. And uh, offshore wind really uh, fits the bill because it's, it provides power at scale and, uh, and it, it increases energy security um, while also allowing these countries to meet their, their climate change targets and, and ultimately reduce coal consumption. So that's really the second reason. Number three is its power where you need it with no land constraints. So the image that you see here is from the Global Wind Atlas um, and it shows uh, wind speeds around the world, including up to 200 kilometers offshore. Uh, the, it's generally considered that wind, that offshore wind is viable uh, at wind speeds of seven meters per second and over, and Clara will be talking more about this in a minute uh, through her maps. Um, what, what you, what you, when you look at this image, uh, there's a couple of things that you notice. The first you, thing you notice is that you've got onshore some fairly good wind speeds, you know, into the orange and red zone, um, but often they're kind of inland and, and away from demand centers. 
Uh, what you also notice is that uh, you don't need to go very far offshore before you start having uh, extremely good wind speeds. Um, and what's also interesting, and this is particularly the case in, uh, in, in Asia, uh, given high population density, land availability, availability is a real issue. And this is uh, for onshore wind and for onshore uh, solar as well. So you realize that uh, the offshore wind resource is extremely strong. It's uh, most often very close to demand centers and it gets away from uh, restrictions around, um, around population density that, uh, that are concerning for many energy planners. And the last reason I, th I think that, that offshore wind is really growing now is that you can put it, put it just about anywhere. The images that you've seen up to now have been, uh, have been a fixed foundation offshore wind. Uh, so these are on monopiles driven into the uh, ocean floor to a depth of around 50 meters maximum. Um, now with floating wind, you can actually put, uh, you can put offshore wind into depths up to 1,000 meters. And the image that you see here is from, the, uh, from an Equinor project, the high wind project. That turbine is floating and it can be placed into waters up to 1,000 meters. And this is particularly important for uh, emerging markets. So again, the, re the reasons that offshore wind is growing, it's getting more competitive, it's clean power, it's uh, close to demand centers and it's power where you need it. And then it's, it can be power even in deeper waters. So with all this in mind, it's not surprising that offshore wind projections uh, are very optimistic going forward. It's anticipated by 2030 We'll be installing at least 20 to 25 gigawatts per year. Um, and this is fantastic news, um, except when you start looking at where the distribution of the installations are, you realize that largely they are still projected to be concentrated in Europe, um, China, and then also North America. But it's, you start to ask the question, does a, you know, will a rising tide raise all boats? And when we look at these projections for offshore wind and emerging markets, it's certainly not as strong as, as we think that it needs to be, particularly because you could argue that it's in emerging markets that, it, that offshore wind is, 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 is most desperately needed. So when looking at, you know, when looking at the opportunity in emerging markets, and as said, Clara will be talking about the, the technical potential in just a minute, there are some considerable challenges as well. And it's generally understood that, um, that you can't transplant directly uh, all of the experience uh, gained in Europe directly into emerging markets for a number of reasons. First is there's a need for infrastructure. Um, so the, uh, the staging ports and uh, construction ports, all the installation vessels that are required are not necessarily in, in the emerging markets that will allow them to immediately install uh, offshore wind. So all of that has to be built or it has to be upgraded from uh, current facilities. There's a need for adapted technology. Um, the conditions in the North Sea and in, in Europe are considered to be uh, ideal for offshore wind. Uh, they uh, do not have seismic activity. They do not have typhoons. Uh, they do not have particularly deep waters. But when you move into many of the emerging markets, this is exactly what you've got. You've got typhoons, deep waters, and seismic activity. So there's a need to adapt the technology. There's a very strong need to consider environmental and social issues as well. Uh, the concerns that you have around, around uh, uh, marine and avian fauna in Europe are different than the ones that you'll have in the uh, in Philippines and Vietnam and Brazil. Uh, there's also a different group of stakeholders in terms of fishing communities and other impacted, uh, you know, impacted groups. And all of this, again, uh, must be adapted according to the country that it's, uh, it's happening in. And lastly, there's a really a need for banking projects. I think one of the big lessons learned from the cost reductions in Europe has been the lower cost of capital. And that's come about through competitive auctions and through conditions that um, minimize risk and allow uh, the cost of capital for the projects to, to go down. And that's contributed uh, as much as the technology has to the uh, lowering LCO um, levelized cost of energy uh, for offshore wind. So with that, uh, what I'm going to do is, is pass, uh, pass it over to, uh, um, to Clara. Um, so as I said, I've kind of uh, given an outline of why offshore wind is growing. And, and one of the first questions we had looking at emerging markets is, you know, what, what's the technical potential? Is there actually the capacity to put offshore wind in these markets? And um, Clara and Rachel have done a great job of, uh, 
of uh, mapping out this potential. So I'll pass it over to her uh, to talk about uh, some of the detailed results that we've uh, come up with. So Clara. Thank you, Sean. So in the next slides, I will um, talk a bit about the methodology that we developed here in house for mapping technical potential for offshore wind. And I'm gonna introduce you to some of the outputs that we generated up to date. To start with, what is technical potential? This is a subset of the resource potential while taking into account some constraints um, related to the system technology and the topography. In the case of offshore wind, this translates into wind speeds of a certain value and into water depth levels that correspond to the two types of technology, uh, offshore wind fixed foundation and floating foundation. For our uh, purpose, in uh, de developing the methodology uh, for technical potential mapping, we considered wind speeds greater than seven meters per second. And we worked with a bathymetry data set obtained from JEPCO. Uh, it's a global data set that is uh, widely used in uh, similar studies. And we took into account two uh, intervals, water depths of 50 meters or less for fixed foundation and uh, water depths between 50 meters and 1000 meters that are considered suitable for floating foundations. The last step we made was to remove areas that are smaller than 10 square kilometers because we did not consider the, uh, them to be suitable for the installation of an offshore wind farm. On the map on the right, you can see uh, Ukraine. And uh, this is just how one of our outputs look like, looks like. Um, and you can see uh, the EEZ border in dashed line. This is another um, information layer that we used in order to quantify the total potential per country. And the EEZ is basically the maritime border of a country. And uh, last, we for all the opportunity zones that we, um, develop, we developed in the analysis, we computed the technical potentials uh, with the assumption of a density of three megawatts per square kilometer for wind speeds between seven and eight meters per second, and a density of four megawatts per uh, square kilometer for wind speeds greater than eight meters per second. Now, we took this methodology and we, we applied it initially to eight countries that were part of the Going Global report that Alastair mentioned at the beginning. This was our first outcome. And uh, we published this report in um, last October, if I'm not wrong. Uh, we then took the methodology and applied it to an additional uh, 46 countries and three regional uh, region, regions, which is the Caribbean, the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. And for all of these uh, countries and regions listed here, we produced outputs in the format of uh, spatial data, but also in, in the form of these maps that you can see on the right uh, side, which are a poster type format with additional information. And they're readily available for download from our website for consultations and review. In the next slide, I'm gonna go through some of the results that we obtained uh, in our first exercise, mapping the technical potential for the eight key emerging markets. And here you can see India. It, and um, if you remember from uh, Sean's presentation, India is the second uh, largest consumer of coal in the world. And you can see here that it has a potential summing up uh, for offshore wind summing up to almost 200 gigawatts. So it has a great opportunity to introduce uh, some green energy into the mix. The Philippines is located in an area with uh, deep waters, and this is reflected in our analysis uh, with a total floating potential of 160 gigawatts and only 18 gigawatts for fixed potential. Turkey is a country for which we will uh, launch a roadmap. Soon enough, Mark can tell more about this. And what's interesting about Turkey is uh, that it has potential on both seas, so on the Black Sea and the Aegean Sea. Uh, summing up to a total of almost um, 80 gigawatts fixed and floating. And the last map in this uh, in this series is Vietnam. Um, Vietnam is an interesting case because uh, we are we are currently working on a roadmap there, and it has um, very good potential both in fixed and floating um, for floating foundations, and it's all located. Um, in, a pro in very close proximity to the main urban centers. And here you can see the rest of the countries from this initial effort. Um, I'm just gonna leave the numbers here for a bit so that you can go through them. But I get the conclusion is that, you know, uh, there's a great potential 
yeah, for, for installing only for these eight countries um, uh, where we reached uh, 3000 gigawatts technical potential um, by applying our methodology. As mentioned, we also um, mapped um, the technical potential at the regional level, and that is very interesting because it gives um, the opportunity for regional cooperation in, in development in the development of such projects, um, which is very relevant, especially for the smaller markets. And you can see here the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, and the Caribbean Sea, all with very impressive amounts of um, um, technical potential for offshore wind. What we did next was to um, um, sum up the um, total potential for the country that uh, we analyzed so far um, at the region level. So you can see here on the left, the six World Bank regions with the total technical potential that only takes into account these countries that I mentioned and with some highlights. And yes, I mean, the numbers are you know, astonishing. Uh, we have a total of 15,000 gigawatts only for these um, countries that we mentioned. And as a parallel effort, we apply, we started applying our methodology at a global scale. So we will update the figures in the previous table by taking into account every country in the World Bank regions. Uh, this is an exercise that um, is almost finished. We still need to do a quality assurance check on it and um, everything will be available for exploration and download um, on our platform, which I'll talk about in, uh, in two slides. Our next step in the mapping effort is to develop a methodology for the practical potential. The practical potential is a subset of the technical potential that takes into account additional constraints, which are usually split into hard constraints and soft constraints. Now, we already started uh, this work uh, testing it um, on Vietnam because we have the roadmap uh, project um, taking place in the same time. And, um, I'm just gonna go a bit through the constraints and then um, yeah, explain the map. So as I mentioned, usually these constraints are split into hard and soft constraints. Hard constraints are, represent um, uh, features and areas that uh, we need, there are no go, we need to eliminate from our analysis. So when we take the technical potential, which is in our map um, in uh, shades of uh, purple, light purple and dark purple, and uh, if, this, if this information layer intersects with any hard constraint, uh, then we have to remove those. Now, for the soft constraints, they are more, um, they have a more of an advisory role in the sense that they tell us that um, in these particular opportunity zones, you have social, environmental, and planning constraints that you must take into account. So just be mindful of this when planning further. Now, the social constraints, some examples, they, uh, they range from the location of indigenous communities to the location of marina and beating pages or where uh, people are uh, carrying out fishing activities. As, uh, as for the environmental constraints, these, these are the bird migration routes, the sensitive um, habitats or the protected areas. And when we talk about planning constraints, we always need to be mindful of the location of the electrical transmission grid and the power plants, but also where the uh, locations where natural, um, natural hazards uh, often occur. So this is something that is ongoing and we hope to have um, a methodology um, yeah, to present to you soon on the practical potential. And I'm gonna end um, my presentation with this slide, which is um, a summary of the outputs up to date and where you can find them. Uh, the Going Global Report and um, the country and regional maps are available on the SMAP website. The global layers are 90% done and uh, they will soon be published on uh, our two platforms, energydata.info and DDH, which are official World Bank uh, open data repositories. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clara. So uh, just to, to recap what we've seen so far as we understand that, that offshore wind is growing because it's uh, competitively priced, it's clean, it's power where you need it, and it can go just about anywhere. Uh, but as uh, said, uh, moving forward, uh, the idea is to try to get that moving into into uh, emerging markets. I think Clara has outlined pretty clearly that that it's not an issue of the resource not being there. We have uh, you know 15.6 terawatts of of potential uh, for offshore wind, both fixed and floating, um, in emerging markets. So that represents several multiples of their current power consumption. 
Um, so what we're gonna do next is, 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 is shift the discussion over to, uh, to Mark, who's going to talk about the, uh, what we're doing to act on the potential and what we're doing to try to help uh, accelerate the adoption of offshore wind into these emerging markets. And very, it's a very exciting uh, initiative that we launched um, in the collaboration with the Global Wind Energy Council, Ben and his, uh, and his colleagues. So uh, over to you, Mark, to talk a bit about the program and how we're acting on this potential. Great, thanks, Sean. Uh, before I start, I think I should mention this photo. And uh, this time last year, we organized a study tour to the UK to coincide with the Global Offshore Wind Conference. And we had 24 representatives from 11 countries uh, attended. And uh, this photo is, is of the group visiting the, the port of Blythe in the northeast of the UK. And you can see a jacket vest in the background. So I suppose recognizing the sort of rapidly, rapidly maturing offshore wind sector Sean's already talked about and you know, the potential resource opportunity uh, for development in, in emerging markets that Clara's mentioned, uh, World Bank Group uh, Offshore Wind Development Program was, was established in April last year um, with an overarching intention to accelerate the uptake of offshore wind in emerging markets. Um, this program is being led by the World Bank's Energy Sector Management Assistance Program, which is known as ESMAP, um, working in partnership with the IFC, uh, which is the World Bank's uh, private sector financing arm. So the main objectives of the program are really to support the inclusion of offshore wind into the policies and, and the targets of our, our client countries, and then to subsequently help our clients to prepare bankable offshore wind projects. Uh, the program was kick-started with the grant of about 5 million US dollars from uh, Bayes of the UK government. Um, and the coming years, we've got an overall budget of, of, for our market development activities of around 10 million US dollars. Uh, Sean mentioned we're working in very close collaboration with the Global Wind Energy Council. Um, they help us to organize events and training, um, as well as providing us with insights from the industry, gathering stakeholder feedback, um, and also insights into the global wind markets that they're, uh, they're active in, and the areas that we're also working in. The program's got three main components, um, to generation and collation and dissemination of knowledge products uh, through things like reports, training and events. Uh, we've got country level roadmaps and strategic studies in support of uh, market development activities. Um, We've also got project level studies to support the development of uh, investment lending opportunities. And the example here on the right uh, is cover of the Going Global, Going Global Report, which is part of uh, our knowledge generation work, which was published uh, back in October last year. You can download online now. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about each of these, uh, these, these, these efforts. So I suppose our, our, our knowledge work at really at a global level provides outputs that uh, can support any of the emerging market client governments that we work with. Um, this includes reporting on things like lessons learned, uh, relevant good practice, um, and uh, to, to help essentially ensure bankable projects. Um, this also includes the work that Clara's just presented uh, to map resources and identify resource potential. We also run activities such as this webinar to to disseminate our work and uh, increase the, the knowledge and understanding of, uh, of offshore wind in our client countries. At a, at a country level, we, we initially support clients to sort of un, uh, I suppose understand their offshore wind potential, um, set a market development vision that we can then subsequently support in, in delivering. Um, obviously to ensure our efforts of, of a meaningful impact, uh, it's important that we work with client governments that are fully engaged, um, want our support, uh, so that really, really can accelerate the development process. Um, and the program can then go on to support client governments to prepare for tendering off to wind projects. So when working with a client government, so the, the process typically starts with an initial workshop uh, with key stakeholders. And then following a request for support for the program, um, we'll then typically commission a, a roadmap study uh, to investigate the conditions in the country for offshore wind development, propose scenario for some market development and growth, um, and suggest actions needed to, to sort of establish a market. Um, that roadmap can then be followed uh, by a whole range of um, more in-depth assistance, uh, support market development activities, and this could include uh, anything from um, uh, policy and regulatory advice, marine spatial planning, maybe grid assessment, um, 
whereas project development activities could include studies then to de-risk individual projects ahead of them being tendered. Um, I should mention that the, the program can fund the roadmap studies, which are sort of typically $150,000 to $200,000, um, and so the market development support. However, de-risking projects, uh, specific studies will typically cost you know, millions of US dollars, so we'll need to go and obtain additional funding from, from other sources. So ultimately, the bank can contribute funding for uh, public, uh, public sector infrastructure like grids and ports. Um, and the IFC can work with, with other lenders and participate alongside them um, in private sector financing of things like offshore wind projects, ports, and the wider supply chain as well. So talk about the roadmaps a little bit. Um, and earlier this year, we pre-qualified six uh, ever experienced international consultancies uh, to deliver our country roadmap studies. Um, the first of these has been in Vietnam, um, as Clara mentioned, and was commissioned uh, in February this year. Uh, BVG Associates are the lead on that, and they've just completed an initial draft, uh, which is going to be going on, undergoing consultation with the government and wider stakeholders shortly. The procurement for a Sri Lankan roadmap is just uh, about completing, and we're expecting that to get underway in the coming weeks. Um, the Sri Lankan government's been incredibly engaged and enthusiastic about this and uh, really wanting to, to, to study the, the resources in detail. Uh, similarly, the roadmap for Turkey is currently being procured um, and that we expect that project to start very soon as well. Um, I should also mention that over the coming years, we're also supporting, uh, sort of managing some project development and de-risking activities uh, that will be carried out under a fairly substantial grant from the EU. We've also got ongoing discussions with governments of, of many other client countries. Um, for instance, we'll soon be starting a roadmap in Azerbaijan, which agreed the, the terms uh, of that roadmap activity with, with that government. Um, and we also hope to begin working in countries such as Brazil, Colombia, uh, India and South Africa over the coming years um, and have discussions going ongoing with, with many others uh, that link into the, the work that Clara just presented. So in addition to our roadmap activities, we're also incredibly busy with our global knowledge work. Um, in September this year, we'll be holding a, a virtual study tour event. Um, unfortunately, we can't get everyone physically together this year, so it's, it's going to be held online. Um, and this will be a three-day event that's being organized by GWEC um, and will include things like virtual tours of supply chain facilities. We'll have uh, seminars and Q&A sessions with uh, offshore wind experts. Um, and more information on that uh, event will be coming out uh, soon. Uh, so following off from the study tour, we intend to be creating a, an online course, a, a massive open online course, MOOC, um, on offshore wind development, uh, which will be used to help educate clients and, and stakeholders in emerging markets and, and help disseminate some of that, that knowledge. Uh, this year, we're also producing a flagship report uh, on key factors for successful development of offshore wind in emerging markets. Uh, this will compile uh, things like lessons learned, good practices and recommendations uh, that are relevant to establishing offshore wind in, in less developed countries. Um, we're also producing uh, environmental and social frameworks. Uh, these will really help to inform the spatial planning uh, of offshore wind um, and help our client governments just reduce environmental and social risks um, and introduce a good practice in the planning of their offshore wind projects um, to really instill uh, environmental and social good practice um, and lessons we, we've had from, from Europe. Um, we've got our rezoning project, which is being led by Clara, and that's just about to start starting off now and that produce online geospatial planning tool uh, for onshore PV uh, onshore wind and offshore wind. Uh, that will include various constraints and economic analysis and will help users to, to identify and prioritize zones for, for development. Um, finally, we'll be starting a study on the incorporation of, of green hydrogen production, which is a, an incredibly uh, hot topic at the moment, uh, including that into offshore wind projects in emerging markets, uh, particularly with the idea to, to investigate the opportunities for, for decarbonizing energy systems in countries with you know, potentially very high carbon emissions in their energy systems. 
So just to, to conclude and wrap up, um, so Sean really is, I think he's demonstrated that offshore wind is, is a, a rapidly developing and maturing industry. And that we certainly firmly believe that this needs to, to move into emerging markets soon. Yeah. Clara has shown that there's, there's definitely a huge potential for offshore wind uh, development. And I think that opportunity is, is in our client countries is, is far greater than, than we, we initially expected. Um, and hopefully I've shown you a bit of a, an overview of our programs, current and future activities and, um, and how we're helping to accelerate the growth uh, of this exciting industry. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, here's a, a list of, of the World Bank and IFC staff that comprise the offshore wind team. Um, most of us are available on the call at the moment to take your questions for the next 20 minutes, I suppose. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Ben Backwell, who's going to moderate the Q&A session for us. Um, and please provide any of your questions in the Q&A chat that you should be able to find in Zoom. Great. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you, all of you who presented. Um, we're going to go to the Q&A now. Um, can I just note, um, so on the bottom of your screens, you'll see a Q&A box. Um, please put your questions there and not into the chat. Uh, box, which is, which is a separate box. And um, we've had quite a few uh, questions um, already. Um, so let's go straight to them. Um, one from Stuart Smith, he says, do you think the growth of offshore wind is growing faster than onshore due to easier planning laws? Surely it can't be technical, can it? I thought maybe that would be one, um, perhaps uh, for, for Alistair and Sean um, to Come back on. Yeah, why don't, Alistair, why don't you take that one and talk about European experience in, in this regard? Yes, I mean, just to say it's growing, but it's also growing as a percentage of total wind installations. <clears throat> so last year, about 60 gigawatts um, of wind was installed, and that's now 10% offshore wind. In previous years, it was down around sort of 4%. And we see it continuing to grow as a percentage of the overall wind market. The major reason is, as Sean mentioned, the falling in prices. This has meant the countries that already have it want more of it. You know, so the UK has 10 gigawatts at the moment. It's taken us 20 years to build. Over the, this decade, the uh, government target is 40 gigawatts in total. So that's a rapid ramp up. Germany is doing the same. And then more countries are picking it up because of the reasons that Sean went through. So it's not one single answer. It's um, the momentum built in the market so far. Back to you, Sean. Yeah, and I think it's also it's important to point out that you know in 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 emerging markets where you already have onshore wind, you sometimes get uh, kind of an impression that offshore wind is development is very similar to offshore or offshore wind development is similar to onshore so if you did it well with onshore then that uh, that works for offshore as well and it's very different the the planning regime and the consenting regime and the regulatory regime that you have to have in place in order to uh, to facilitate offshore wind development uh, is more akin to oil and gas than it is to onshore wind and part of the work that we're doing uh, through the program is trying to work with countries to identify these bottlenecks and to try to figure out to try to wrap their heads around what's specific about offshore wind and what needs to be put in place in order to facilitate its growth um, so yeah that's a that's an important part of the the puzzle because as, as the question pointed out it's not a matter of resource potential the resource is definitely there maybe and, i add to the answer uh, in terms of the planning bit of this question in the uk we've had just over 50 projects go to planning. We've only lost two to the planning um, rejection. That's incredibly low. So, and large part of that is it's some distance from shore, there's less individual objections and you're dealing with organizations rather than individuals. So yes, planning is easier, even though it's very different to onshore. Okay, thanks. Look, we're getting we're getting actually lots of very very interesting questions. So I'm going to just keep throwing these at you if that's all right, because it's uh, it's, it's see how many we can get through. Uh, 
uh, Thibault here is asking, can you clarify whether there's any advantage with offshore wind compared to onshore wind or solar PV in terms of intermittency? In other words, is it a more reliable source of electricity from a grid perspective other than compared to other renewable energies? Who'd like to say something about that? I'll take it again. Um, so I'm going to use some generic numbers, but um, PV obviously doesn't work very well at night. Uh, works better in very sunny places, but I'll use the UK number. It's only 11% uh, capacity factor. You'll get to 30% in some places. Onshore wind, depending again on the location, might be of the order of 30% capacity factor, um, whereas offshore wind is now up at around 50%. So it's, and um, International Energy Agency has now coined the phrase for offshore wind that it's variable baseload. It's, it's taking huge chunks of power at times the solar and the wind actually complement each other. So uh, that's one of the reasons it's so attractive as a renewable energy source. Thanks. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I'll just add, add, just add, add to that quickly. Um, so um, if you're interested in looking at that a bit more detail, the Global Wind Atlas, um, if you find Google Global Wind Atlas online, um, gives you pretty good insights into typical profiles of offshore wind, uh, both on a, a daily profile, diurnal profile, and, and monthly variability and seasonal variability. So you can sort of compare the offshore wind resources compared to your onshore wind and, and PV resources too, and, and see how they tie up for your country. Thanks, Mark. Um, I have a question here from Pierre-Adrien uh, Opinel. Um, I think this is one uh, perhaps for Sean. What are, what are the particularities of financing schemes for offshore wind projects in emerging countries? Um, I, know it's, I know it's early days for many, Sean, but what, what, what have you seen so far? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, um, I mean, one of the, uh, you know, one of the aspects, I mean, IFC has financed a lot of onshore wind. We've financed over about five gigawatts around the world, you know, 42 some odd projects around the, uh, around the world. Um, and, you know, those have been uh, non, most of them non-recourse project finance. Um, one of the big differences with offshore wind is just its scale. Um, so a typical onshore project will have, you know, a capex of, you know, say 100 or $200 million. Uh, whereas a typical offshore project can be well, you know, well north of 1 billion or even $2 billion. So from a financing perspective, it's a very different uh, matter uh, just by virtue of the number of lenders that are in any kind of uh, that are in the syndicate um, and the allocation of risk it's uh, on onshore wind you'll have what are called fully wrapped epcs often so you'll have just a single entity that you're that you're financing uh, for offshore wind it's not unusual to have you know five or ten uh, or more different parties that are you know that, that, that are that are involved on the sponsor side so the, the, the size of it is much more complex. The, the, uh, the nature of the construction is much more, much more complex. Um, so we have, to, we have to try to deal with these things. But luckily, you know, the, there's already been a, you know, a good wealth of knowledge built up in Europe, just looking at project finance structures, uh, moving away from kind of the balance sheet financing that was done at the beginning. Um, so we're learning this, but uh, this is, a, this is you know, as I mentioned before, I mean, the cost of financing is a huge, element of driving down the costs. Um, and we have to uh, you know, get used to the risks, uh, work with other partners because we'll be one of uh, many in a, in, a, in a syndicate of lenders. Uh, but once we understand those risks, uh, then we're able to drive down the cost of financing. Um, and that's and ultimately uh, have more competitive power uh, where it's needed in these emerging markets. And that's and really that's, I think, our uh, you know, part of our role in this um, uh, in the development of, of offshore wind in emerging markets. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, we had a few, a few technical uh, you know, questions on the study and the mapping for uh, for um, uh, for um, Clara um, uh, here. One is um, Clara. How do you determine the two installed density values? Is the three versus four megawatts kilometer squared installed density for low and high wind? Due to the due to larger turbines for low wind, so there's that one, and there's a related question here. So if I could just I'll just give you a few questions, Clara, if that's all right, and then you come back um, from Kenneth Lobo. Hi, why three megawatts and four megawatts 
per square kilometer if you can use 10 to 12 megawatt per square kilometer. That's another one. And then just also, I think for, for, um, um, uh, for, for you as well, is um, why so little resource in sub-Saharan Africa, if, if indeed that's the case. Um, so maybe, uh, Clara, you could you could have a go at some of those. Thank you, Ben. I actually saw the questions uh, regarding the um, uh, methodology um, behind the potential, and I, I was hoping that you will bring them live because I need to pass the floor to Alastair here. Um, I forgot to mention in our uh, slide uh, when we research on the um, on the thresholds that we need to apply for each uh, information layers and. Uh, information layer and how to compute the technical potential and capacity. Uh, we carried out um, some consultations with the private sector, but mostly we were uh, led by Alastair um, into this process. So he will have the, the correct answers for um, why we ended up with uh, these values uh, for the two intervals of wind speed. And I'm just gonna answer, I answered in the chat on the Sub-Saharan Africa question, um, and but I, I can also answer it live. Um, so the figures that we have there, uh, I mentioned we only did the mapping exercise and what we presented is for a limited number of countries, but in parallel, we um, applied it at a global scale. So we actually uh, mapped every country in Sub-Saharan Africa and our uh, total potential for Sub-Saharan Africa is 3.16 terawatts. So it's, it's quite impressive. It's just we did not um, uh, present it as such in these slides because they still need to undergo a validation um, exercise. Um, so the table that I presented is only for the um, eight countries in the initial report, the 46, the 46 following countries and the three regional maps. Yeah. But um, yeah, just before um, muting myself, when we finish the analysis, all the information layers with the attributes behind, they will be made available via the energy data that info. So please keep an eye on that. Um, and yeah, you'll be able to explore the results yourself. So thank you very much, Clara. Um, so the three and four megawatts per kilometer squared, some of that comes from research. Some of that comes from discussion with two other bodies that are looking into this. One is DTU in Denmark um, and Birkbeck College in London. And firstly, the seven. So it's, it's not economic at the moment to build seven, mega, um, seven meters per second, but in 10 to 15 years, we believe the industry will mature similarly as it did in onshore wind. So that's purely a boundary number. Um, eight meters a second and above, that's where things are getting built at the moment. So that's one of the reasons we had the two. Then the lower density for lower wind speeds. Again, you would tend to see that. But it, even the four megawatts per kilometer squared is not very dense if you look at single projects, but we're not looking at projects, we're looking at regions. So we tried to be a bit conservative. I mean, the numbers that come out are still colossal. So if we'd put in much larger numbers, we'd have been um, criticized for being overly optimistic. We're being conservative. But yes, certainly when you get into projects themselves, you start to see densities, five megawatts, quite common. I've seen some as high as 12 megawatts per kilometer squared, but then you get very large losses. So long answer to a simple question. Great, look, we're gonna tr try and push ahead and answer as many of these uh, questions as we can. Our, uh, our friend uh, Rodrigo Rojas uh, says, greetings from Costa Rica. Um, regarding offshore projects, what is the strategy of the World Bank to close gaps between developing economies um, sorry, developed economies and emerging economies, for, ex for example, on supply chain, infrastructure, and so on. Maybe I can take that and, uh, well, Rodrigo, good to, uh, good, to, good to have you. Rodrigo was one of the participants in the, um, in the study tour that we had in the, uh, the UK last year. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of this, the, it's a great question, and it really points to the need for regional cooperation. And I think, uh, one of the big lessons learned that came out of Europe is that you know no single country is big enough on its own to be able to develop offshore wind. Uh, the countries must work together uh, on particularly on supply chain and value chain. And we think that this is certainly the case in um, in many uh, other regions of the world, and that this is where the uh, you know emerging markets are, are going to be working with uh, 
know, with the OECD countries, Asia is a perfect example. So the supply chain that we're now seeing uh, building up in Taiwan, uh, Japan is looking to build up very quickly. There's, that's going to be part of the network we see with, you know, with the supply chain and value chain in Indonesia and Philippines and Vietnam. You know, in India and Sri Lanka, you're going to get these regional hubs uh, of development. But those, in order for it to make sense, they have to be able to work together. Uh, having a silo of a supply chain and a value chain in a particular area uh, doesn't make sense. Um, but on a regional on a regional perspective, it, it it does. So you know, you'll have towers and foundations coming from uh, you know from from Indonesia. You'll have other value chain, the supply chain coming from 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 other countries. And the same certainly in uh, in the Caribbean uh, will be the case where you'll get. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, where you'll get uh, this regional effect. So I think that it, it, there's a, uh, just by virtue, virtue of its scale and complexity, I think there will be a required uh, collaboration and a regional view of, um, uh, of supply and value chain development in order ultimately to, to bring down the cost. That's what you want, it's a competitive industry. And the best way of doing that is having um, you know, OECD countries and, and, and emerging markets uh, collaborating together. So that's it's a key focus for us, and that's why we're really trying to uh, convene these groups at a regional level and working with other partners as GWEC and others to, uh, to try to do this, because that's re really where the power lies. I'd say that getting, getting the, the regional picture into it uh, gives you a, a larger pipeline of opportunity for the supply chain companies to get their, uh, their teeth into. And um, a key part of the roadmap work that we've been doing is to, to sort of assess the, the economic potential for, for these countries that we're working in. Um, and, and but not only considering that country in isolation, but yeah, if let's say other countries around there in the region also develop their uh, offshore wind potential, then you know, what are the other the export potentials for that country? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mark. And um, let's let, um, two qu uh, quick questions on India uh, related. Um, Arab says. How far do you think India is away from having its first offshore wind project? And uh, Kishore says, how can the World Bank and IFC help India create its first offshore wind project? Mark, why don't you take that one? Sure. Uh, so I've, I've been personally involved in India for the last six or so years in offshore wind and uh, seen it go through a number of cycles of uh, some potential studies being taken forward and uh, resource assessments and site identification. But uh, as yet, we haven't really got to a project, as you're aware. Um, I mean, the, the government's I think, uh, intention is to keep going with offshore wind, um, and we'd hope to see um, potentially the first demonstration project coming out in, in, the, in the coming couple of years. Um, and I think we'd, we'd like to see that happen in Tamil Nadu, uh, purely because the wind speeds there are much stronger, um, and it could be a, a good first place to start. Um, we, we've got good, pretty good engagement with the government ministry of uh, new and renewable energy there and, uh, and Niue. Um, and we can support, uh, I suppose, in, in any of the ways sort of mentioned in the slides, um, in the studies that, that, that they need, um, which could be, you know, looking at an initial demonstration that could follow on then as, into a, a second phase of a larger project, potentially. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to point out with India that India you know, has the scale to really <laughs> to really make this happen. I mean, there's, we've seen that the, uh, the resources there in uh, Tamil Nadu and also Gujarat and a couple other areas, but um, you know, the, the existing wind industry is, uh, and supply chain is very strong in, in India, um, but it's a matter of really setting ambitious targets. Um, and certainly those targets are in place. I think it's uh, 30 gigawatts anticipated in India by 2030. Um, but it's a matter of putting in the policies to make that happen. If they, uh, if those, uh, if they reach those targets or put in place the the uh, the links of the chain that are needed to accomplish it, then then um, there's no doubt that India has the scale, the knowledge, uh, the resources to be able to uh, capitalize. But uh, again, it's all driven by um, it's all driven by policy and and certainty from the uh, you know from the um, private sector um, perspective. Price, yes, price sensitivity as well is, a, is another key factor there and it's something that's uh, maybe stalled discussions previously so um, yeah, on, onshore wind and, and PV prices and the auctions they're getting in India are, are incredibly low um, and yeah, there's a, a gap clearly between offshore wind and, and the, the other renewables. Uh, so something we've been looking at recently is um, yeah, what are the financing 
options that we could we could play with to try and reduce the cost of capital that could drive down the cost and the tariff that's required. Right. And so we're going to bring things to a close uh, very shortly now. Um, one uh, you know, fun question, I think, to, to close. When will an emerging market see the first um, emerging markets uh, floating offshore wind project? Come on, just give it, somebody give a few uh, ideas. Somebody take a punt. That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, the, uh, I would, I mean, Asia is certainly uh, a leading contender. I think there's, uh, we've seen that the resources there, we've also seen that there's a great deal of, uh, of deep water. Um, so places like Philippines or, you know, you've got great resource, but very deep waters close to, um, you know, close to demand centers. So, um, you know, it's also, I think we're seeing that, uh, you know, Japan is certainly pushing forward now. And over the past week, we've seen some announcements there that have been very favorable. And Japan is likely going to have a good portion of floating wind. So it may become sort of the, uh, the anchor. And then you're going to see a uh, floating wind coming up in, uh, uh, again, in places like the Philippines, I think, uh, but you know, it, it's hard to say. You know, certainly in, in many places, South Africa has an, has an incredible wind resource, but very deep waters. You might see floating wind there. There's already been some talk of it, uh, and then uh, the same is true in, uh, in 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 Latin America. So it's going to be quite a race. But uh, I, many people project that over the long run, floating wind, if they can, if the cost can come down to the point of fixed foundation, uh, that's really the big key to unlock this uh, this huge potential in Clara showed that uh, you know that out of that 15.6 terawatts of total potential two-thirds of that is floating so um, there's a real vested interest for emerging markets to get that down so I don't know maybe uh, Alistair what's your what, 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 what would what would your bet be uh, towards the end of this decade I mean we've got floating wind itself needs to get up to commercial scale uh, largest project um, is currently 30 megawatts in Scotland Next is 88 megawatts in Norway. We need to get them up to something closer to 500 megawatts. And that's going to take a bit of time anyway for, the, for, for their costs to come down. And then through this program, getting emerging markets ready for floating wind. It's a slightly different construction technology, but um, I think that's feasible. Great. Um, that, um, sorry, Mark, do you want to say last, uh, last uh, word? Just a, another potential opportunity is that uh, some of the emerging markets around the world, particularly small islands, for instance, have got very, very high prices of power um, and okay, they don't need a huge amount of demand, um, but there may be opportunities for developers to deploy small projects there, that are obviously a high, high tariff, but could displace things like diesel, um, and particularly if, if you're a, a floating developer that's looking to test and demonstrate a technology, it could be an opportunity. So, if someone finds that opportunity in the coming years, we may see that happen sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's great. And that brings us uh, very nicely to the end of our webinar. Um, thanks everyone for attending. It was, you know, it was lively and we had lots of great questions that we didn't answer as well. And I know the World Bank team will, will get back and answer those um, as well. Please reach out to Mark and, and Sean and the rest of the team um, to find out more about the program. Um, reach out to GWEC if you want to find anything else, else out about what we're doing. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, future discussions and webinars like this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Ben, for moderating. I really appreciate it. And thanks.